Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our conversation today about evaluating the impact of artificial intelligence as applied to education. I'm Elizabeth King. I was the Global Director for Education at the World Bank for a few years. And in that position, I was the Senior Spokesperson for Policy and Strategy um, related to Education and Human Development. I am currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And joining me today is an illustrious panel of speakers. And I'm very honored to be moderating the discussion about AI with Chris Didi, professor at the Graduate School of Education, Harvard University, Bart Epstein, president and CEO of EdTech Exchange Evidence, and also professor at the University of Virginia. Jim Larry Moore, who is the Chief Officer for Equity and Learning at RIID Labs, and Oli Vallo, CEO and co-founder of Education Alliance Finland. So we are also representing, I suppose, different time zones. Our panelists bring a deep knowledge and diverse uh, experiences to our discussion today. Their individual areas a focus will help us understand how education and technology systems, ecosystems interact when we try to bring uh, new technologies such as AI into, the, into education systems. Today, we will discuss the implications of using AI on the way students learn, how teachers teach, how education systems support and improve teaching and learning. But our specific focus is how we can assess whether AI solutions are in fact delivering on these expectations. I would like to know what our panelists think about metrics and analytical methods that are appropriate for evaluating the impact of AI and the effectiveness of AI solutions and how we can be sure that we will be measuring causal impact. So let me begin with a few comments to frame our conversations. Many of us are convinced that, parent, that, that rapid advances in artificial intelligence, AI, can have a profound positive impact on our economies and our societies as a whole. From self-driving vehicles to life-saving medical equipment and diagnostic algorithms to detect new coronaviruses cases, for example, AI promises to revolutionize our daily lives. AI solutions are also making a huge inroad into education. A recent industry report predicted that in 2020, the global ed tech industry would be worth an estimated $252 billion. So AI tools are being designed to assess students' skills and weaknesses to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and create personalized learning uh, materials and study guides. This te technology is already being used in advanced countries, but I hope that today we will not forget that there's also demand and need in poorer countries, in developing countries. And an important question for us is, is AI appropriate learning technology in those countries. So lastly, and this is part of my background, timely and reliable evaluation is a critical input into obtaining better and better design and implementation of any innovation. This is why in this conversation, we will keep on returning to the questions about data, about metrics, and about analytical methods. So my first question is actually for Oli Valla. I was struck, Oli, by the preposition in an Education Alliance white paper. And I quote, that paper says, in an educational design, the goals have a two layer and somewhat contra contradictory structure. For the learner, the solutions should support learning in a way that the goals should be as personal and autonomous as possible. Learning should preferably be directed towards mastery of the content and skills 
instead of mainly performing well, whereas from the viewpoint of educational diagnosis, uh, sorry, design, the goal should be narrowed and clear in order to, to design the pedagogy accordingly, and most importantly, integrated into activities. Thus, on the one hand, content mastery, and on the other hand, effective pedagogy. Now, what does it mean to evaluate the ability of AI solutions to meet and reconcile these twin, twin goals of content mastery and effective pedagogy? And, and tell us about what you think about data metrics and methods that are implied for that evaluation. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Beth. It's a, it's a great question. And, and uh, uh, when, when, I, when I saw the question, I, I, it got me reflecting upon the, the, the sort of the basic paradox or dilemma when working as a teacher as well, that um, as a teacher, you want to practice the best possible pedagogy and, for example, providing autonomy for the learners to, to choose between different types of activities or choose between different content. It can be very, very important part of the learning experience and can, lead, can have a positive impact on the, on the learning outcomes as well. But at the same time, when, when thinking about that kind of a, like a, like a um, positive aspect in the learning experience as, as autonomy and, and flexibility, as a teacher, and I suppose for, for, a, for an education technology app as well, it is really a challenge to, to be insured and, and, and be comfortable uh, with uh, trusting on that the autonomy and the flexibility that you provide for the learner is used in the right way. Uh, so designing this uh, learning journey with this kind of prefixed, very clear prefixed uh, learning goals uh, can be more comfortable for you as an, as an educator or uh, as, a, as a user of an AI app or, or education technology app. But at the same time, this kind of prefixed learning journey, it's probably not the best possible learning experience for, for different types of learners. Uh, when, it, when, when thinking about how, what AI could bring on the table and how AI could help with this, this challenge of finding the best pedagogical practices, but still uh, providing meaningful and, and this type of relevant learning goals for the learners and ensuring that the learners are, are using the autonomy or the flexibility in the right way and achieving the, the content mastery and, and achieving the, the content related learning goals. Uh, I think that AI can really help through um, providing ways to assess the student's progression and performance in the, in the long run in a very systematic way. Um, as we know, with, with the use of different types of educational technology tools, we can collect a lot of data from the student's performance and, and activities. For an educator, it can be really a challenge to sort of analyze that data by themselves to, to, to use it for, for assessment purposes or to use it to understand that how students are progressing. Uh, so, so thinking about how AI can help educators, I, I see that the one clear benefit is that it can help with the assessment practices, uh, crunching data, uh, providing analytics for the teacher to, to, to use for, for to, to give grades for the students, and also to understand that what are the what are the development areas of certain students in their understanding and, and, and who, are, who are those students who, who don't, maybe don't necessarily need so much additional help uh, without the, the use of AI and, and, and just analyzing the data by themselves. It, it, I, I see it's, a, it's really a tough job for the, for the teacher. Right, and this, this seems to me, at, I mean, as a follow-up question, what kind of teacher training that would you need to, to to be able to take advantage for the teachers to have the skills to be able to take advantage of all that data. I mean, in many countries, teachers are not necessarily trained to deal with so much data. And um, presumably, you know, and, and, and it could be quite a burden actually, if you have a whole lot of data for each student, if you have a classroom of about 80 to 100 students. Mm. So yeah, yeah, definitely. What, what could be done about that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and I, I think it's also a, a question of how much can we expect from the teacher and what can we expect from the tools 
that the teachers are, are using in the classroom. Of course, teachers need training and they, they need to be prepared to use certain tools, uh, maybe AI-based tools in the, in the classroom, if found suitable and, and needed. But at the same time, I think that those tools that are provided for the schools should be designed in a way that they don't require huge expertise from the teacher to, to, to fully benefit from the, from the use of the tools. And, and that's really what, what we do at, at uh, EAF. So, so when we evaluate tools uh, with our group of teachers and teacher evaluators, we, we take a look at the tools design and also from the viewpoint that is it easy to use? Is it intuitive? And, and can teachers really benefit from the, from the features that it provides? Uh, and if it's too complex and if it, it, if it would require too much from the teacher, it's, it's definitely a, 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 an improvement area in, uh, that, that we will point out in, in our analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oli. Um, let me turn to Bart. Over the last several years, Bart, you have led a massive effort called the EdTech Genome Project, which sought to discover why technologies perform differently across school environments. And we really are very interested in knowing how AI will work in different school environments. So what did you learn during that work that may help us understand what type of evaluation we need in order to identify the factors that account for such differences? What lessons did you learn about how to assess the readiness and willingness, for example, of teachers and school leaders to integrate AI solutions into their curriculum and pedagogy? Those are great questions, Beth. Uh, I think that AI, first and foremost, should be a tool to make teachers' lives easier, to free up their time so they can spend more energy focusing on the highly complex human motivation and emotional issues, as well as the most complex concepts that need highly personal interactions. Uh, I spent a decade building and running the world's largest online tutoring service called tutor.com. And it's just fascinating to see, even in a digital environment, how sophisticated humans can be in their understanding of each other's needs and the cadence of the back and forth and looking for cues about um, when students are stuck or frustrated. And as AI gets better and better uh, at that, determining whether teacher bots, which is what we're, we're calling them, are working on the surface level should really be pretty easily easy to do equitably. You can design studies where a large number of students go through a curriculum receiving various lessons from humans and other lessons from teacher bots. And with a large enough sample size, we should be able to detect the differences in performance and we can rotate students through different lessons between humans and teacher bots so that it's fair and no one is deprived of the opportunity. But I believe it'll be very important for us to be careful about what we measure. Because if the only thing we look at is whether a student answers an equation correctly, then we're missing important pieces of the puzzle. Right now, we don't distinguish through much research between two groups of students who may score the same on a math computational exercise, but very widely in their creativity, adaptability, flexibility, motivation, inspiration, and other factors that can be impacted by the variation between different teachers and will likely vary greatly between humans and chatbots or teacher bots. My hope is that as we start to develop measures intended to evaluate the soft factors in AI, we will realize that those measures are likely to have substantial value more broadly beyond AI. This should help us not only distinguish the value add of humans as opposed to bots, but also help us humans understand our strengths and weaknesses so we can improve our own performance. So Bart, this project, does it include rich countries as well as less rich countries? So, because I'm thinking about 
you know, the differences in school environments that, that you've looked at and whether the, the lessons from different school settings is, are, 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 you know, are, are really, um, can, can really help improve the design and implementation of AI. Eventually, yes. The project is relatively new. Um, before the massive data gathering phase, we needed to go through the EdTech genome project phase to reach consensus on what educators in the United States believe to be the most important implementation factors and how to measure them. And that will certainly have overlap between countries, but for example, um, in the United States, one of the important factors is teacher agency. How important is it that teachers feel a sense of ownership and engagement and authority over the decision about which technologies get brought into the classroom? And what we're seeing is that it's the more complex and potentially disruptive the technology, the more important it is for the teachers to feel as though they had a key role in selecting it, whether to go forward at all, which brand to use, uh, because we need them to not just do it grudgingly, but to embrace it and to persist through the challenges and struggles of implementation and the inevitable hiccups. And so in your school, if you go through a long, rigorous, thoughtful process where you listen to teachers and you pick something. And then as the leader of my school, I simply copy you because I say, Beth's school is great. I want to be like Beth. And I bring it in with no engagement. It may be a failure. Uh, but how teacher agency plays out varies culture by culture. Um, some cultures have uh, numerous languages that they have to uh, a deal with inside technology. So uh, this project started in the United States and our eventual goal is to collect contextually relevant feedback from tens of millions of teachers worldwide so they can learn from each other's experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. That's very, very interesting. And I hope we will get to follow uh, the progress of the project. I, I now want to turn to Chris. Chris, you know, we have to think about also um, the, the school of the future. How, how might we reimagine schools and education and learning opportunities based on the human-centered use of current and emerging technologies, including AI, of course? And could we think about uh, school years that are not just nine to 10 months, but 12 months school years and allow the, the students to learn throughout the year. We all know about the loss of learning um, gains or the, yeah, loss of learning actually during the summer vacations, right? So could AI be the solution we're looking for to make sure that uh, students learn throughout the year? So, one of the things that we know is very powerful in education is personalization. And by personalization, I don't just mean adapting learning to a student, but a lot of student voice and student choice. So having the ability to choose how you learn, to some extent what you learn, the time, the place, the path, the pace. Imagine a student that has an individual tutor and that tutor is, is providing uh, learning experiences for you and watching how you respond. And that tutor is from your own culture. So knows how to interpret what's going on. It's not just individual, the tutor puts you in a group setting and watches you in terms of how you're interacting with and learning from others. That would be a wonderful opportunity, but of course it's financially impossible. So in 2019, I co-edited a book about engineering learning. 
And the concept behind engineering learning is that you take a very large group of people, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands students, and you uh, are interacting with them online so you can collect a lot of data. And you do what are called A-B experiments. So at random, half the students get a lesson that involves a higher level of challenge and half get a lesson that involves a lower level of challenge. And then you see in, in each half who does better and who does not so well. And then you do another experiment where you group all the people who did well with higher level of challenge together and give them another higher level of challenge thing to verify whether or not your, your inference was correct and the same with lower level of challenge. But then you also start other kinds of experiments. So you experiment with more teacher-based learning or more peer-based learning. You experiment with a learning that is more video-based or more textual-based. Uh, and, and of course, there's a very large number of dimensions that you, can, that you can assess in terms of personalization. So you can think of this as like a microscope or a telescope in terms of engineering learning. Uh, the microscope was a huge breakthrough because the data was always there, but we didn't know it was there. And then we didn't know how to collect it. And then we didn't know how to analyze it. But when we did, it changed everything. Telescope, same story. AI gives us the ability at scale to collect and at least to a limited extent to analyze that data to enable this kind of engineering learning. So that after a period of time, the system understands a lot about how you like to learn, what you want to learn, and all of these other variables that are going on. And one of the sad things about the pandemic, I. Um, co-founded a series called Silver Lining for Learning that looks at the opportunities for educational innovation that the pandemic created. And the engineering learning has not really happened even though we've had the opportunity to collect this very rich kind of data and to do these kinds of A-B experiments. So this um, is a real opportunity for equity because now you're looking at each student in terms of the strengths and the needs that they bring to any particular learning experience and responding to that just as the tutor does. Now, it's, it's a workaround for what AI can't do, which is AI cannot be that tutor. AI does not know how to interpret cultural differences, human nonverbal communication and signals, and so on and so on. But by doing these experiments at scale, you can try to get to the same place. How would you evaluate it? Uh, I would take a randomized small sample out of this huge group of students where the system thinks it knows how, they, how to personalize learning for them and have a human being interact with them for a while, a skilled human being from their own culture. And that that person could say, well, the system got this, this, and this right, but it missed this and it got that wrong. And so you have an evaluation mechanism. So I'm excited about the opportunities, but unfortunately we're not really acting on them. Right. So Chris, what, what do you think is needed to actually prepare school leaders and education system leaders to be able to use AI data? to be able to use AI data wisely, effectively, and proactively about, you know, thinking about future curricula um, uh, and, and changes to, to teacher um, training? Well, I think the most important thing, and, and this will change over time, is understanding what AI can do and what AI cannot do. So there, there are plenty of people who are happy to sell you magic AI in the same way that we've seen many kinds of magic technologies uh, attempted to be sold 
in education. So they'll say, oh, my AI can look at an individual student on the screen and it can understand their motivation and it can understand their cultural heritage, blah, blah, blah. And of course it can't. AIs don't have a human body. AIs do not understand the nature of culture. AI has no moral or, or ethical sense. But there are other kinds of things that can understand and help with at scale, finding these kinds of patterns that I'm describing. And, and so it's, it's a matter of having an assistant that's really stupid about some things and really smart about other things. And so you use the tool uh, to take advantage of its strengths and not to fall into a trap about its weaknesses. Thank you, Chris. So, um, Jim, we're thinking about education challenges today and, and tomorrow, and I already started to mention the school of tomorrow. You know, and, and many people talk about 21st century skills and, and, and Bart started to talk about also um, sort of creativity and, and flexibility. And I think that's all we all understand that really schools are being challenged to teach not just content, but also um, skills for life, social emotional skills, you know, all of these things that, that really students expect or parents expect their children to, to learn uh, in schools. And in addition, the nature of jobs and economies is changing. Uh, a shift from routine tasks to metacognitive, non-routine analytical tasks, the ability to do those tasks. So if a goal of education system is to ensure that students graduate with not only a body of knowledge, but also a capacity to become adaptive experts and on the job learners, can AI help education systems to meet these goals? Uh, can, I know that you've all sort of touched on this already. Can AI teach creativity, flexibility, innovativeness? Um, Chris was saying that, you know, it's, there's a lot of challenges still for kind of uh, AI to, to deal with sort of cultural specificities. But, and, and many people would say, you can't teach creativity anyway. But is, it, is this too much to ask for AI to be able to do for our students in the future? Yeah, so I think, you know, I would um, maybe reframe the question a little bit, I think, and based on some of Chris's comments, I think if we take a look at what uh, where we are in the evolution of um, artificial intelligence from uh, in the past, the system of machine rules uh, kind of um, uh, and sequences that could be programmed into now looking at uh, deep learning and neural networks and other kind of approaches. I think the, the real question for me is, you know, in what ways can AI be helpful in teaching creativity? Uh, so on, on its own today, no, I think AI is not in a position to do that, but in the right hands, um, being used and kind of playing to the strengths of what some of these technologies can do. I think that AI can contribute uh, to the teaching of creativity, flexibility, collaborative problem solving, but we'll have to design for that, right? And, uh, and so I should start with a confession. So I'm not an AI scientist. I'm not a data scientist uh, or um, a technologist. I'm a sociologist by training and a, and a career educator. And um, so I start off with a fundamental belief that as an educator, uh, that under the right circumstances, just about any student can learn just about anything, uh, but that learning might um, uh, rely on differences in terms of pedagogical strategy, the kind of content that the student might find most engaging. Uh, and as, as Chris has pointed out, and I think Bart alluded to as well, um, we also have to pay attention to the student as a whole person. Right. You pay attention to the social and emotional uh, demands that learning will place on them and that will vary um, across uh, students. And I would say also that um, social and emotional uh, strengths vary across teachers, uh, right? So another uh, area that we would need to pay attention to. So I would say that in terms of um, uh, creativity, flexibility, and um, innovativeness, uh, that those are skills that can be taught. Uh, but you might also argue that they're um, not only skills, but they're mindsets. 
uh, so that the approach that someone might take to a problem, uh, you know, that you can uh, cultivate uh, a more um, elastic or creative sense of possibilities. And I think this is where, you know, AI uh, can be helpful um, in responding to certain cues from a learner or uh, in trying out or maybe doing, doing some of the A-B testing uh, that Chris referred to and seeing which strategies might work uh, with which students and to what effect, you know, at scale so that we can uh, learn more quickly um, as educators. Um, so, you know, the final thing I would add in at, at this point <clears throat> is that um, in general, as an educator, when I, when I talk with people who do understand artificial intelligence at a, at a pretty deep level, um, I think um, that educators have to own part of the conversation. We have to talk about when you might use AI to optimize for speed and when you're really trying to optimize for something else like mastery uh, or a deeper uh, understanding of something or the ability to go from um, a narrowing or convergent kind of approach to getting to an answer to a more divergent creative approach. Because uh, you know, AI is uh, ultimately it's a tool uh, and it's a tool that is in our hands. So we need to make decisions about um, how we want to use that tool. Thank you, Jim. I want to turn back to Oli about, but this time I want to ask about um, teacher preparation to use uh, to use AI, to use the data and to see AI as a friend or a partner, right? We all kind of mentioned teachers here, but I'd like to know, you know, Finland is one of the best performing um, uh, education systems in the world already. It already has that. Um, why do you think, I also want to ask, will teachers accept AI in their schools? Because autonomy is so important for teachers, as you know, Ali. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that the, uh, well, autonomy is really important for, for teachers. And uh, I think that in, in Finnish schools, the, the autonomy that the teachers have uh, when, for example, selecting what learning materials they use in their classroom, they basically have full autonomy. They can decide whatever devices, whatever material they want to use, they, they can fully decide on that. As long as they follow the national curriculum, everything is fine. They can, for example, create their own learning materials and only use those. Uh, I think that Finnish teachers in general and probably teachers globally as well are being relatively or, or pretty critical towards use of use of technology. Maybe there have been some negative experiences of, of uh, getting getting some some devices or some content or devices without any content almost at, uh, at all, and 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 uh, huge expectations towards teachers to to, to start using the, the technology now and 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 uh, make a complete change in the in the ways how how students are learning. And as we know, it, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, it, technology and, and AI, those, those are only tools uh, that, that, and it really depends on the teacher, how those tools are being used in the, in the classroom. And like Bart mentioned, the, the agency for the teachers to, to be involved in selecting the, the tools for themselves is, is really important. And I, and I think that it's, it's the same with AI tools as well that, um, and maybe I would even go one, one step further that uh, being involved not only with the selection of the tools, but sometimes even creation of the tools can be really valuable so that the teachers has, have true ownership of the, of the tools that they're using in the classroom. And they have maybe had a say as well that how these tools should work. And when they have that kind of AI tools or edtech tools in general in their hands, I think that they are quite engaged making the most of, of, of using, using those tools and really benefit, benefiting or having their students to benefit from the use of those tools. Um, so so yeah, yes, I, I think that it's good that teachers are critical. Uh, at the same time, I do believe that teachers maybe need more information and, and, and sort of convincing that there are certain benefits with the use of AI and, and technology in classrooms. And 
and if they are engaged in the process of selecting those tools, they they probably start start benefiting more of of the use of those tools. And 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 that um, the uh, education uh, the edtech genome project. To what extent were teachers involved in that project? And um, because you, you talked about teacher agency and 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 and. and and, and Ollie's saying that really we have to, uh, teachers have, have to be, have to see AI as partners and support for them. So teachers are the heart of everything that we do. And it's paramount to understand their environments. Uh, teachers' environments, get more complex, more burdensome every day. The, the one phrase that I have learned that makes a teacher's head want to explode is just one more thing. <laughs> no one ever comes to a teacher and says, I wanna take away just one thing. We're gonna have one fewer forms or processes. And this is where AI can really help. Um, in, in other parts of our lives, we have, we have automated in ways that made us forget how unpleasant it used to be to have to do everything manually. Um, it used to be that in the early days of automobiles, you literally had to go out and stand in the front of the car with a crank and start it. Uh, and then we have electronic starters and all cars used to be manual shifters. And now we have automatic transmissions. And I think there are plenty of parts of teaching that are quite amenable to automation in AI in ways that teachers will find wonderful and freeing. But we have to keep in mind that anytime we ask teachers to do anything new, there's a transaction cost and there's risk. And we see this a lot in the question of whether a school should switch from one technology to another. If a school is using a, a reading program and it's been in place for five years, even if that reading program isn't very effective, it's likely to remain in place because the mere process of considering whether to switch first throws everyone into a tizzy as they're considering whether their investment in learning that program will now go to the wayside and they'll have to start something new and then they need to do a pilot and then you lose some efficiency while you learn a new system and hopefully you'll eventually have um, enough efficiency gains to make that risk and those transaction costs worthwhile. I think that's where we need to look for AI is what are the things that AI can do best, most reliably so that it can be a net positive for teachers so that they will want to use it and they'll feel confident that it's making not only their lives easier, but it's a net benefit for their students. Thank you, Bart. I think Jim wanted to add something to this conversation. Yeah, I did. I, I think you're following um, Bart's example of the feedback from teachers and, uh, and um, the time constraints that they operate under. Uh, you know, I think it, it's not uncommon for teachers after a very long day at school to spend their evening at home either grading assignments um, or creating assignments for future use, right? Potentially even the next day. So this is an area where, you know, we heard at, at Red Labs, uh, heard the same feedback from teachers that we pulled together in a focus group. And we have now a prototype of something that, that we um, want to get some field experience with, uh, which is a, a platform that will, would allow teachers to upload their curriculum and then use AI to create a set of homework items quiz um, items, potential test items that could be uh, sent out or delivered to students using a, an online learning management system. Uh, you could take it a step further and have student responses um, submitted digitally uh, or online and, and use AI to do an initial pass at scoring or grading uh, for a teacher then to review. You know, I think we're further along um, in um, uh, things that may have a, a, a simple right or wrong answer. Uh, in the future, natural language processing will allow uh, improvements around um, written responses, open-ended written responses from students. But this is the sort of thing that uh, potentially, you know, worked on with enough um, 
uh, consistency and enough uh, teacher input and guidance along the way that could become a, a major labor saver. You know, maybe give teachers back one to two hours per day uh, in their lives, which they can use either to have uh, better home uh, or work-life balance or to uh, have time that they really desperately need. And I think typically want uh, to give back to their students in terms of more personalized attention. Thank you, Jim. Um, Chris, you know, the um, teacher value add is the, the method that um, when we look at, you know, just who are, who are the better performing teachers, we, we want to know, well, what have they added to the learning uh, of their students? So, t so, so value add measures are, are quite important in, uh, the f in education for, for evaluating teachers. So how, tell me what you're thinking about in terms of when you add this very important input um, called teacher bots and, and AI, and, and all that, how, how would it, and, and also the fact that here now is a, an added um, challenge for teachers about who is the best, who, who are able to best use AI as a support for them. So how does this change what we understand to be the right methods of valuing teacher performance, evaluating teacher performance? So as, as part of answering that question, I want to step back a bit because I think the largest impact of AI on education will be changing educational outcomes that we want, even though it will also have the kinds of powerful effects we've been describing on changing educational processes. So one of the things that we know is happening in the workplace is that AI is having a major impact on occupational roles. And part of what educational institutions do is prepare for the workplace. It's not the only thing, but it's an important thing. The papers and media are full of stories about AI replacing jobs, but that's actually a relatively minor effect. The major effect is that AI becomes a partner in many kinds of jobs. And it's important to analyze what role the AI plays as a partner and what role remains with the human being. So this has been a theme for a long time in science fiction. Some of you may know the series Star Trek, The Next Generation. There's Captain Picard, who is the human. And then there's Data, who is a human-like android, who in fact is an AI device. And um, the two of them can accomplish things together more than either can alone because the partnership is based on, on what in the field people talk about as reckoning versus judgment. So AI is very good at reckoning. It's good at predicting, forecasting, calculating finding patterns in huge amounts of data. And whether it's Data the Android or whether it's Mr. Spock in an earlier Star Trek or whether it's Jarvis interacting with Tony Stark in the Avengers or even going all the way back to Hal, uh, the computer in 2001, um, the reckoning is what the AI does. Judgment is what people do. And judgment could be described as practical wisdom. It's understanding how you take the patterns and the predictions and the forecasts and the calculations and factor in human cultural dimensions, the, the nature of, of being human and having a body, uh, ethical and moral dimensions, and so on. And so things go badly awry when the AI tries to do the judgment part of the role and people uh, end up doing less when they don't have something to help them with reckoning. So let me be specific now about teachers. I um, work with Ashok Goal, 
who is uh, an AI expert at Georgia Tech University. And he is developing a series of AI-based agents to help college professors. So there's tutors for content that pick things that many students don't understand and need individual help with. Uh, he's building question answering teaching assistants that take the 400 most typical questions in a large course and save the professor the trouble of answering them. There's library assistants, there's um, laboratory assistants, there's assessment assistants, there's even a social assistant that scans all of the student introductions and looks for matches of students who might enjoy interacting with one another and, and make suggestions to them. So here I am in the future, surrounded by all of these assistants. I can be de-skilled or I can be upskilled. If I'm just sitting there waiting for the assistants to tell me what to do that they couldn't do, my job is de-skilled. And um, there's really no value that's added except I have more time to do other things. But if instead, I deepen my judgment and are, am able to work more closely with students on these other dimensions, these human dimensions, then I'm upskilled and then the partnership has a much greater value. And the way that that's referred to is IA versus AI, intelligence augmentation, which is the human and the AI, judgment and reckoning versus just AI. So teachers have the opportunity to do what, what most of them really would like to spend more time on, the judgment parts of the job, the human parts of the job, if AI is allowed to take over the reckoning. But although I can be optimistic about that kind of process, because I think teachers go like that, I am less optimistic about our ability to change the outcomes of the educational system. Because we're caught up in the high stakes tests, including Harvard. To get into Harvard, SAT, ACT, GRE, LSAT, that's reckoning. We're preparing a generation of students to lose to AI, <clears throat> to be de-skilled by AI because we're training them to do what AI does instead of focusing on judgment. So I think that that's a huge challenge for education is understanding not just to do better the things that we're doing now, not just doing things better, but doing better things which involves moving towards judgment. Sorry about the long answer, but I, I think that this very, is a fundamental issue. Very, very helpful. And, and in fact, I, I start, you know, I really think about what, how to change the way teachers themselves are trained. Because they, I mean, it has to go, the more we use AI in school systems, we have to really think about how teachers themselves are trained, how school leaders themselves are trained because they integrating AI wisely, efficiently, effectively into education systems is the big challenge, I think. You know, many, uh, you know, several of the evaluations of ICT in, in the schools have not really produced consistently positive effects. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because education systems do not actually use these technologies well. So the question I think for, for really for, for us to think, be able to take advantage of all the benefits that we've been talking about for AI, we need to be able to prepare school systems to use AI. And this, it has to start with teacher training. Comments on that, Bart? Yes, at the University of Virginia School of Education Human Development, we have seen that technologies that get used in the classroom are the ones that pre-service teachers become comfortable with during their training. And ideally, they become comfortable with it by being the students. And 
AI offers great promise here in helping teachers truly master the concepts that they will be teaching. Uh, teaching has multiple dimensions to it and subject matter expertise is a very important part of the process. And AI can do a really good job at helping us to identify individual subtopic competencies and weaknesses and help us bolster those weaknesses so that teachers can eventually spend less time in their training reviewing how to do the quadratic equation and more time on how to teach and classroom management on those difficult and complex emotional and motivational issues. Um, at at uh, UVA, we're also working on a classroom simulation program that involves real life situational training. But currently that program requires real people to be actors behind the scenes. And right now AI, uh, at least that we've had access to is not quite ready uh, or realistic enough to simulate the behavior of hypothetical students. But you could imagine that uh, a, a classroom simulator that does a very good job of having student simulated frustration, distraction, disengagement, uh, behavior problems, uh, you know, having a, a weakness in some concept from 18 months ago, to have those things realistically displayed uh, to a pre-service teacher so that they can practice dealing with them in a safe environment. That's something that most other industries do. Uh, most pilots spend many hours in flight simulators uh, and I think AI in teacher preparation is probably uh, one of the highest value nearest term opportunities for it to really show off its emerging skills. I, I want to focus as one, uh, as the last last topic here, the question of the digital divide. So the digital divide is is uh, is an issue that that has been raised, in particular with respect to technology, both in terms of divides in. Uh, more affluent families, more affluent countries and communities versus less affluent ones. And in some of the countries still, there are, the divide is between men and women or boys and girls, right? And um, how, how can AI perhaps, uh, and the implementation and the design of that help level the playing field of learning for, for children? Uh, those who come from less affluent families and also girls in societies where there's a, also a gender divide. I don't know whom, who of you want to answer that question. Well, I can talk a little about that because Paul Kim is an associate dean at Stanford who has done a lot of work in global South countries with very marginalized populations within those countries. And he's developed um, an initiative called SMILE, the Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning, that, um, that has a low cost infrastructure associated with it. So for about, um, for less than a hundred dollars, a school can get a box uh, a Raspberry Pi box that is a server, it's a memory, it's a wireless router, it uh, connects to the internet when the internet is available, it has a battery so it works when electricity isn't on, and, and it, it provides a whole elaborate curriculum so where's the AI in this? The AI is that one of the things that Paul teaches is how to ask great questions. How, should, how can students learn as young as first grade to ask great questions? Because actually learning to ask a great question is, is judgment while learning a quadratic equation is reckoning to go back to what I said earlier. Now, he now has more than a million students 
in these different kinds of settings using this great questions curriculum. And so the question becomes, how, how do you evaluate the questions with this many students? Because there's five different levels of questions from simple recall all the way up through questions that somebody from Harvard might take you know, an hour to answer. And the answer that he's come up with is AI, that, that these, these millions of questions are fed into an AI database that uses machine learning and pattern recognition in order to sort questions into different kinds of bins. So it, it can explain why your question is a level three and praise you for what took it above level one and give you hints about how you might get it to level five. So again, with big data sets that, that span even very marginalized populations, there's a kind of teaching, a narrow kind of teaching where I, AI can make a difference. Thank you so much, everyone. I, I really learned a lot. So the reason why I asked about 10 years from now, it's actually just nine years from now, 2030, is because you know, the UN uh, has with so many 189 countries ratified or uh, enshrined rather the sustainable development goals for 2030, which uh, and, and, and uh, goal four talks about, you know, universally students must learn and students must learn the most fundamental skills. Um, and yet we've just been hit by, a, by a, an epidemic that actually has caused a lot of learning losses. And, um, and, many, and on top of that, I mean, this is on top of the fact that so many children are not learning the basics even before the pandemic. So many people are calling this a learning crisis. We are at a learning crisis and education systems have to actually deal with that. Think about how to move forward, how to recover the learning losses from this past year and how to then move forward. And education systems have to think differently. This is, I think, a moment for some really important and revolutionary thinking about uh, schools, about how to organize schools, about how to train teachers, about how to organize the education workforce. And by that, it's not just teachers, but also then how to use AI, I think, since that's what we're talking about today, as a partner in that teaching and learning process. So I've learned a lot. I'm not an expert in AI by any means, which is, and I, I love being a part of this and moderating this, um, this, uh, uh, this panel. And I want to thank you very much for all your contributions. You have, uh, you have, uh, you have emphasized that AI has a role in schools, but it also has a role in actually improving the whole system. It's not just, we can't just talk about individual classrooms, individual teachers. We have to think about how to improve the entire education system. Advances in AR are without a doubt, opening new possibilities for teaching and learning with a promise of transforming pedagogies and transforming the way education systems operate. So how can we use and set up schools and school systems in order to realize the potential of AI technologies? How can they transform, transform low, low performing education systems in a variety of contexts of many different countries. As we said at the start, planning timely and reliable evaluations should be an integral part of the design and implementation of AI solutions. We, we, can't, we can't avoid that. Actually, evaluations is, a very much, is very much a part of AI solutions. So this is the challenge for practice pioneers or application leaders of these technologies all over the world. And this is why we discuss this important topic today. So thank you again to each of you panelists for your rich contributions to the discussion and to the audience. Thank you very much for listening.
Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.